Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. In the studio waiting to be profiled is author Marilyn Bennett. And uh, Marilyn is... <laughs> Marilyn is going to be here as our first guest, but we're also going to have interior designer Sari Ehrenreich uh, on the show. Lawyer, author Marilyn Bennett is a tax and business attorney in Los Angeles who was born and raised in Kansas. She graduated from UCLA Law School and has written two self-help books, uh, 10 Biggest Legal Mistakes Women Make, that was written in the year 2000. And then she continued with a new book called Honey, Just Sign Here, Honey, Just Sign Here, Honey, which had many of the same ideas, but I guess you went further with it. Yeah, it's really a, a revision of the first book, and I added uh, some new, a new chapter, and I expanded some other chapters, and I'd address some questions that I found women were really interested in as I, I went around and spoke oh, on that, my first book. Oh, I see. So then you did add new things. Yes. I love the way you started. God is love, but get it in writing. Absolutely. <laughs> that was so great. You open the book. That's your beginning. That teaches you what to do, right? Yeah. Well, that's a key thing. As I think any attorney would tell you, it's very important to get your understandings and your legal agreements in writing because if it's verbal, it's going to be a you said, he or she said, whoever the other person is in the deal. Why have you been such an activist uh, for women, writing this book for women, because I don't think this is a man's book, is it? Well, the principles really apply to men as well. In fact, a, a male friend of mine read it and told me he wished he had read it three wives ago. Oh. So <laughs> <laughs> they do apply. The, but the I, other wives <laughs> read it before he did. <laughs> but I, I did write it primarily for women because I have found in the, I've been practicing law now for 20 years, over 20 years, and I've, I've worked with a lot of women who I found just trusted other people too much and looked at the world perhaps too, through glasses that were too rose colored and didn't really take care of themselves. And I have, it's been my experience that women do that a little bit more often than men. So I really wanted to tell women that you have to be careful. You, know, you don't want to be suspicious of everyone, but there's, but you can still make sure you understand what your legal rights and obligations are when you're signing a contract without really meaning that it doesn't trust the other person. Well, let's start. That's the difficult part with what you said, that to get somebody to sign something and let them know that you, you do trust them, but you still want it writing. Uh, I think that's the hardest thing, and maybe that's more difficult for women to, to do than for men who come on with a very business-like approach and say this is what has to happen. But with women, um, there's, so, there's 10 mistakes, and let's start with uh, failing to protect yourself in a prenuptial, agree uh, prenuptial agreement. Yes, women are very reluctant to sign prenuptial agreements uh, for the most part because they think it means that the person they're marrying doesn't trust them or that doesn't think the marriage will last. The reality is about 50% of the marriages don't last. Marla Maples, I think, is a person who is, who, whose story really shows the concerns that can come up with a prenuptial agreement because she says she did not read the one that Donald Trump gave to her and asked her to sign just shortly before they got married. She didn't read it. She didn't. She says she didn't read it, and so she didn't really know what was in it. And apparently there was a provision that said if their marriage lasted more than five years, she would get a little, whole lot more if they divorced after that than she would get if they divorced mm. in the first five years. And after about year four, Donald Trump filed for a divorce. So he had read it, he knew what, what it was, and so she ended up with a settlement that she may not have understood she would, would get or, or a result she just wasn't expecting. So failing to protect yourself and your children in a marriage. 
That's very important, again, with the number of marriages that don't oh. last anymore. Uh -huh. But and how do you protect your children? Isn't it, uh, the child the uh, product of that marriage? Certainly, but you have to uh, take into account that you know, if something happens in your marriage doesn't last, you may end up being the primary source of support oh. for the oh, children. Oh, so a couple sad. of things that a woman should think about while she's married is if she has separate property, and that's property that she had before she got married or that she inherited, or you know, this from some source other than the community to make sure she keeps it separate and doesn't mix it up with marital property. Because once you mix it up, it becomes community property and gets split on divorce. Well, then that kind of goes along with uh, failing to protect yourself and your children in divorce. Absolutely. Does that couple with that? Yes, it does. Yeah, there are things that you need to do while you're married to protect your assets, and commingling is one of them, or not mm, commingling so, or assets. Not. And I've worked with women in situations, too, where they're, they weren't getting divorced, but their husband's business failed, and because they had mixed all the property together, the creditors could go after their property as well. And if they'd kept it separate, they might not have been able to, and that would have given them a new start as well, even yeah. in a case where the marriage did stay together. That, that takes me to the next one where you, one of the things you said was failing to protect yourself when starting a business, yes. uh, starting a new business and running it. So that yes. kind of couples with what you just said too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's a lot of common themes through all of this. There really is. And women-owned businesses are growing at two times the national average right now. Mm. So it's a very exciting development in our economy. But women need to be careful when they start a new business because, again, unfortunately, too, a lot of them fail. And you want to try to protect your personal assets if you have a home, if you have some mm. money in the bank, and, and try to keep, it out, uh, keep that out of the business so that if your business doesn't work out, the creditors can't reach that. So one of the things I talk about is forming a corporation or a limited liability company. Oh, so that keeps it totally separate. Yes. And you can still be married and go through those those things. Yes. Uh -huh. And then yes. I think one of the things you said is the women run out the door when uh, the signing of documents come about. If your husband yes. comes to you and says, sign these documents, you go, no, I don't want to see that. <laughs> Yes, you know, legal documents are, are long and kind of tedious to read, I think, and so people don't like to read them, but it's really important <laughs> to try to and ask questions and really understand what you're agreeing to, to take on, you know, what your responsibilities are and how it will affect you in the future if things don't go right. And uh, finding the right tax man? Well, taxes, taxes are a very, very... <laughs> or neglecting the tax man. Yeah, neglecting the tax man. <laughs> yeah, you know, taxes are a very important issue for people because it's single, probably the biggest single expense that any person incurs when you take into account income taxes, sales taxes, property taxes, everything that we pay. A lot of married couples file joint tax returns. Most do, well, yeah. in fact, because it's a, there's some tax <laughs> savings we by doing do, that. We do, we <laughs> do. Most do. I think over 95% of married couples do. What a lot of married couples don't understand, though, is that when you are signing a joint tax return, you're telling the IRS that I'll be 100% liable for mm -hmm. that, for any taxes you later find out is due, even if I've since divorced my husband, uh -huh. and even if it's his earnings or his deductions that created the extra tax. So it's a uh, joint and several liability is what we call it. And there's some real horror stories of women who have been contacted by the Internal Revenue Service long after they were divorced oh, and held way. responsible for just humongous tax liabilities. Really? That kind of takes me to the next thing. It's like everything's following suit here. Mm -hmm. But how does a woman get help? Does she come to a, an accountant, to a lawyer, to um, the neighbor, you know, how do you take care of yourself in these situations? Uh, if you can afford your own accountant and your own lawyer, that's really the best way to go because they will look at the documents and the tax return just from your view, you know, just from your vantage point and tell you how it will affect you. If you can't afford that, then talk to the lawyer that your husband uses on the account and just ask questions and try to understand what it means. There's also a lot of good self-help books out oh, as that's well. That's, that's the the other thing that I thought was kind of funny was you said uh, women or people fail to fire their lawyer at the right Absolutely. time. Absolutely. <laughs> I've seen that often too. And I think that women have trouble 
firing lawyers when they should because it's not you know it's not nice it's uh, it's right. it's an awkward thing it really is it's difficult to do but sometimes if you're not communicating well if you just don't feel like they're doing the yeah, best job yeah. for you, you it's really better to move on and you need to do that so just I have about three more questions to ask you I <laughs> want to ask you about how you prepare for your death and illness because <laughs> we fail to do that yeah, too. yes yeah it's important to have a will or a trust. And those things are in the back of this book, yes, which are. I thought was pretty interesting. Do those hold up? Well, the the samples, the, yeah, the samples that I included at the back of the book are pretty basic samples, and so they'll work Help for you, most yeah. cases. That's, Although, that was interesting, yeah, I thought. Yeah. Most people have a you know, yeah, unique set of facts, though, so it's also good to, it, really advisable to consult someone who who works in the area and can help you with that. But let's talk a little bit about some of the famous people. You've also, like the Soroya Khashoggi, who's a Middle Eastern, well, I don't want to say what he is, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. she got a really huge divorce yeah. settlement. She, yeah, she did. Uh, uh, she says it's not as high as it was reported in the media. And I include her in my book for to illustrate a point, and that is to, in if you're getting a divorce, to not focus so much on what's fair. You, women, and, and a lot of men too in divorce, get really caught up on, but this has got to be fair, and if I don't get this, I'm not being treated fairly. And you run up a lot of expense, and she tells the story of how uh, her husband's, Aiden's uh, uh, assistant, didn't reimburse her for a bottle of nail polish. Oh, I know, that was so silly. <laughs> and she got really, really angry because that wasn't fair. And so she called an attorney here in California. She was in the Middle East at the time. And she notes that her uh, the cost of her phone call cost more than the nail polish. But, but it they was not fair. But it wasn't mind, fair because, because she should have been reimbursed that nail polish. So they just started in into war against each other and they spent a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of heartache before they finally said, whoa, what are we doing? That's one example and then just before we leave, I know Doris Duke and her health care, which is something we just yes, talked uh -huh. about a little yes, bit. Yes, yes. She had a, a you tell well, us. <laughs> she had a, she changed her will a lot and uh, the last will gave her butler a lot of, uh, you know, a, big right. amount of money and, and pointed him as the administrator and and a lot of people th that was contested some some of the other beneficiaries thought he had unduly influenced her and you know talked her into changing the will when she really didn't want to and that comes up a lot and it seems this fight seemed to come up more often when there is a will that's changed a lot of times. Oh, is that how, what happens? Yeah, it keeps it, getting changed. Yeah, it keeps getting changed. You know, if you've had a will that's been in place for five years or ten years, it's less likely to be questioned than if it's been changed a oh, lot and it's changed right before and that, that a that person dies. A lot of times with yeah, the, yeah. The, the Doris Duke type of people. If they're all, Marilyn, yes. this has been so interesting. Well, thanks for having me oh, on. Thank you. Just sign here, honey. <laughs> I know there's that little tab that you put on all the legal papers now. It says sign here, sign here. Yes, sign that's here. right. Yes, uh -huh. <laughs> and we have one. Of, we have one of these on the cover. <laughs> it's already a made-up tab. Yes. <laughs> thanks for watching, Marilyn Barrett, and we'll be right back with interior designer Sari Ehrenreich. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with interior designer Sari Ehrenreich, who was born and raised in Los Angeles. She went to Beverly Hills High School, she went to Woodbury, and how did you decide to be a decorator? Well, it started uh, when I was moving my furniture around at eight years old. <laughs> oh, it started And my early. mother would wake up the next day and be horrified that I'd break my back after I'd rearrange my entire room. I see. So it started early. Absolutely. You wanted that. Um, did you work with a firm, or have you always worked on your own? I started apprenticing with a very fine designer, Fred McCowan, who's still in practice in, while well, I was in college. Every day I went to school early in the morning, and I worked for him in the afternoon. So he started me on big projects, like he would do Raquel Welch's house and I would do her daughter Tani's room. Ah. And uh, we did Alex Trebek, we did a lot of agents at uh, CIA, CAA. What a, CIA is good. No. That's very good, CAA. C 
so uh, that's how I got my start. Ah, and then where did the clients come from? You're well, on your own now, right? You have I have company. been on my own for 30 years. Oh, so. And uh, my first job before I moved to New York was for Randy Newman, the, his home the, in Rustic Canyon here in Los Angeles. The musician? Yes. Composer. And then I moved to New York, and I lived in New York for many years designing interiors there. Uh, but and where did the clients come from? It's always so amazing. How, do you, how does a decorator or designer who really is on their own, her own, find clients? You find them from so many ways. In the early days, I would do a home, and they'd then, tell people, and they would refer me, which is always the best way. So it's usually referral, would you it's say? It's always the best way to get business. But as years went on, I got to know architects that would bring me in, like Richard Landry, uh -huh. or I would advertise, or I've done a lot of House and Garden Network shows, and people around the country have seen my work through my Designer Challenge show, and so I'm developing a a whole practice of in, of national consulting now. Oh, I see. So it's just uh, it the evolves. exposure. And social contacts as you move through, you know, your children's life. I meet a lot of people through my son and, and being involved with my community and getting to, you know, just networking in life where people get to know you and like you because as an interior designer, you're a very intimate professional. Yeah, you have to be right there. Do you have a signature style, would you say? I would say my style is what my clients want to have. I wondered about that because a lot of times though when you're saying a client comes to a, a friend's house and sees what you've done mm -hmm. and they, oh I just love this, I have to have the same thing. And then it seems like a designer would then start setting up some kind of signature theme because that's what that all the clients see and want. For some designers that works beautifully. For and me, you've seen it as a formula, of course, haven't you? It's a formula. It's not a formula for me. For me, at this point in my career, I certainly want to hear what my clients, how they want to live, and I hear their dreams, and I have the intuition of trying to help them live in their house better, how to have those intimate moments with their family, how to have cuddled up moments reading stories and studying with their parents and having the house properly lit and giving their homes mm -hmm. order. That's what, you know, any good designer can give you a pretty house. But help them live better in their home is what my practice has evolved to be. That's a totally, actually totally different thing, but those should go hand in hand. Absolutely, absolutely. Because you, uh, so many people, and I know, I think designers are really criticized for this, uh, in a way, a crit critique. Someone will walk into the house and go, oh, who could ever live here? It's just so perfect. And you know, yes. that happens many times. And people are afraid to have a designer come and work with them. They're afraid for a few reasons and I try to dispel that right from the start. I don't live there. <laughs> right. I don't tell them to get rid of anything. I do an inventory on what they have, what they've collected through their travels and what they treasure. We want to showcase them. I care about them inheriting furniture. I send it straight to my restoration man, uh, a gentleman named Zoltan Papp, who restores my clients' beautiful, beautiful inherited pieces. So you look at things totally different than saying, oh, I couldn't live in this room, you know, or how could this person live in this room? It's just absolutely perfect. Nothing's out of place. That's not the real world. That's what happens when you're ready for a photographer to walk in. But for a real family that's going to live a beautiful life, you want to give their home the right space in order for them to live there as real human beings. I love the way this photograph is with the arch. You're looking into this room. Is this, uh, this is your work? This is a project very close to my heart. This is a clientele that I've had for many years and um, we started redoing their house then we completely tore it apart. I brought in the architect and we just... And as you look through the arch you come into the room at the living room and you see this uh, the whole thing up close and your kind of warm touches the, the shawl the blanket hanging on the sofa you want to describe it just a little bit well it's an exotic home filled with different textures and natural colors and in, in my work when you design a home in California as opposed to New York you want to bring the outside in and in this case this home is in Pacific Palisades and the house has colors that reflect the nature and the landscaping that you see when you're looking out all the windows, which gives you a feeling of serenity, mm -hmm. that making a transition when you walk in the door, it melds the outdoors with the inside. The, the other two uh, pieces that I wanted to show are, are just, I guess they're all the same. 
This is a different, this is... That's my rabbi's study. Oh, this is the rabbi's study, yeah. Right. Let's and talk about this a little bit, because I think it's great. Stephen like, Carr Rubin and I did it together. I took him to the design center, and we created a, a beautiful space for him to welcome all his congregants into his uh, study. Floor-to-ceiling books. Right. You, you had to... Have you custom the, built. the wood and We work did it with all him? together. Yeah, that's a beautiful room. This, though, I think, we have two views of this. I'm going to show the over the overall view first. Well, that's my living room, where my <laughs> in-laws had brought that Chinese screen in from Shanghai. Uh, so you kept it, obviously, Absolutely. and made it something good. Absolutely, and it's a room that's always evolving, because I think rooms shouldn't be static. I'm always changing pillows and accessories. I have books everywhere in the room, on another side of the room, and it's just a room that our family enjoys. And Let's put this one up. And this is a little closer Ch look at chess it. Chess is often played. And, and that wonderful wooden chest in the back. That's a TV cabinet. Is it? Which I always like right. to hide them. Well, we see what you can do. And we know you've been picked to work on the LA Magazine Design House, which is a project that Richard Landry, the architect, uh, has done. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, this project was probably the most exciting and wonderful experience in my 30-year career. Uh, first, I got contacted by LA Magazine last year that this was about to happen and that Richard was the architect. So I called up Richard and I, I asked him to be part of it. But yeah. how? But did they buy the house? No, no, no. LA Magazine contacted Richard. They selected Richard as a world-renowned architect that right. has done homes for Wayne Gritsky and Rod cool, Stewart yeah. and Kenny, um, G. Kenny G and Eddie Murphy. And but he is the nicest man. His his clients won't do anything without him after they meet him. I mean, I was with Chaim Saban's wife the other day, and she told me we'd never build a house without Richard. And they've done two beautiful homes with him. So that's who he is. So they selected him. And he builds um, with a great passion for European grandeur. Yes, he does. And, but and yes, and you never know the same architect did the same house because he uh, is doing what his clients ask. He's done modern and traditional and uh, European. Every one of them is a jewel. And so, LA Magazine chose him for his talent, and then he, they said to him, do you have a client or a house coming up that would be appropriate? And he, Because they wanted to photograph it? Is that what it is? They wanted to develop this whole project together. That's what LA Magazine chose to do. Oh, LA Magazine's president said, we want to support Los Angeles. Los Angeles is about the architecture that is developed in the city, and we want an important architect that's doing exciting modern architect today and they chose him, and they asked him if he had a project coming up that would be appropriate for such a, an I idea. See, I see. So he had built a home for Lorna Auerbach before, and of course, all his clients keep him. And she's the construction company. She's the construction <coughs> developer, and she was dreaming up this house because she was in love with southern Spain. She had a passion <coughs> for this part of the world. So she developed it. She took a zillion photographs herself. She took Richard with her to Spain. She brought a lot of the architectural details here that are incorporated in the house, like corbels and the gates. <coughs> so it was a marriage. And then they began this project with Tyler Development. Ron Udell is the president. And I've never seen professionals work like this before. Specifically, though, for LA Magazine. Yes. I and see. they've never done a show house before. Now, we've all heard about show houses. I was just going to ask you what, this is totally different though. Show houses are usually houses in uh, staid uh, neighborhoods where 10 decorators come in and do a room each. Exactly. And then they sell tickets and the money goes to charity. Exactly, which is what this will be. And it's going to a wonderful charity, Holly Grove Children's Services That's Agency. That's great, yeah. But this was different because Richard was like the grand producer. And he would <coughs> meet with each one of us designers. So there were like, what, 10 or 12? There were 17 of us. 17. And we never saw what each other were doing. But it was almost divine, spiritual something that he created that he keyed into all of us. He guided us in a direction so that what we did complemented each other. Because that's often a criticism of design houses. They exactly. say, well, each room doesn't belong to the next. Right. Richard knew how to get the best out of us. And he would pull me in the design meetings and push me even harder 
to go create larger, more. He just pulled the best creativity did, did out of all of us. Did you meet with the other designers? No. Were you in a room? No, all no. one on one. He did it one on one. We didn't meet each other until we were installing and developing it over a two week period. Some of the designers I knew, some of them are my friends, but... And then they photographed it, then Los Angeles Magazine photographed while you were, while it was being built, while you were doing right, things. Right, right. And they, it was a, a melding of all of us. And once we all met each other, we were like an amazing team That's of right. making this happen for each other. And the construction company, Tyler, had reps there. They had a designer rep that kept everything calm to make every sure that when things went wrong, as things always do, that we found solutions. And so we just, everyone kept calm and worked together as a team. So was it like a spec house? No, 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 no. It's not? No, that's the most important <laughs> part. Lorna's going to live there with her family. Oh, it's not a spec it's house. It's not a spec house. I wondered how the funding came about. I see. Well, she's getting a lot of wonderful things done by us. A lot of sources are doing them at cost, and you want to work this hard when people are so gracious with you and so appreciative. I and mean, she had a big dinner party for us at the home. Her husband cooked everything to but thank also, us, which is really nice. But it also um, shows the city yes. with all, everyone who's living in the city, living in Los Angeles, working together and making something like this. Well, that was her goal, that she wanted to see give an opportunity to the city to see the background of how these things happen and the story I believe will show that in LA Magazine. Oh that's so great. I'm so happy you came Sari to oh. show us and talk to us about all this. I wanted to just show this one great picture Thank of you, you before we went. Thank you. I think, do you Thank use you. this as your business card? I do. <laughs> because it's so fabulous. Thank you. Oh, I've loved being here with you, Joan. It's been many years since I've seen you. I know. I'm so happy you were here. And thanks for talking about Richard Landry, because now we can keep our eyes open and see what he's doing. Absolutely, and the rest of the designers. Thank you. And thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles today. Keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, 917.